I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. I'm Thomas O'Neill White. I'm Angelie Preston. We need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is What's Next. A dedicated hour to have important conversations about the issues facing the marginalized and underrepresented communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We're gonna have some real healing. We've gotta have space to tell some uncomfortable truth. What's Next continues our mission to discuss race, equity, and the common concerns of Buffalo's East Side and beyond. In the suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. This is What's Next. I'm Jay Moran. On this episode, Yanni Seren. In 2013, he arrived in Buffalo as the Peggy Pierce Elvin director for what was then known as the Albright Knox Art Gallery. Much has changed at the institution, not the least of which is the name, now officially, the Buffalo AKG Art Museum. The museum campus, of course, has changed dramatically. Gone is the parking lot that was an Elmwood Avenue eyesore for decades and has been replaced by a great lawn. Added is the Gunlock Building with its state-of-the-art gallery spaces, glass box theater and sculpture terrace, and a connecting indoor bridge that offers vistas of Delaware Park, Elmwood Avenue, and Buffalo State's iconic Rockwell Hall. A refurbished space called Town Square welcomes visitors to the museum. The permanent collection remains very much intact, with its legendary works from Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, Clifford Still, and others. Visitors, however, will find that collection in a decidedly different order. The cracked marble floor has been replaced. The lighting updated. A lot has happened at the AKG, and director Yanni Seren openly discussed those changes and more during a summer tour of the museum. We can can start here. Ralph C. Wilson, Jr. Town Square. Yes. Is this actually an art installation? Yes, it is. So this is called Common Sky. Common Sky is an artwork by Ulafer Eliasson and his partner, uh, Sebastian Behrman, from Studio Other Spaces. And it literally is uh, a sculpture that was created uh, to stand in this sculpture courtyard of the past, which is now today the Rolf C. Wilson Jr. Town Square. You know, when I came here to visit, it was a stark change from the last time I came. I was walking in, normally there was just a wall here, and you'd point to the right, and you'd go pay, pay your admission. Instead, there's this beautiful space here. Talk about the intention behind that. So if you think back in time, the Buffalo AKG Art Museum has had multiple architectural incarnations. During the first four decades of our journey as an art museum, we lived in rental spaces in downtown Buffalo. That's from 1862 until 1905. Then in 1905, thanks to the philanthropy of John J. Albright, we get our first permanent home, the neoclassical Wonder, designed by E.B. Green. Which, which opened its doors to the public in late May of 1905. At that time, if you were to look at the museum campus from above, you'd see these two beautiful park paths encircling around the neoclassical building. On the north side, you'd see what today is Iroquois Drive. And on the south side of the neoclassical building, you'd see another park path connecting Hoyt Lake with Elmwood Avenue. Fast forward 60 years from that moment of opening of the E.B. Green building, what we today call call the Bob and Robert and Elizabeth Wilmers building, and the museum is seeking to expand its footprint uh, to be able to uh, exhibit its growing collection, also to have an auditorium, which it did not have at the time, and auditoria were, of course, important spaces for museums to welcome guests and share art historical and other stories with their various publics. So the museum didn't have an auditorium. Uh, First, an architect was contracted uh, in the mid-50s, 1950s, to design the expansion for the museum, uh, an, an expansion that had been dreamt of already during the days of World War II in the early 1940s, but that came to naught because it was the wartime and there wasn't money and all that. So Paul Schweiker, uh, then head of the Yale University School of Architecture or the Department of Architecture was hired to design the expansion 
for the museum, and he designed a new wing on the east side of the Wilmers building, facing Hoyt Lake, and that was considered an affront by Buffalonians towards this beautiful neoclassical building. And basically, Paul Schweiger had to leave town and never come back. <laughs> it was horrible to read those articles. Did it make you feel any pressure when you were putting it this did, project together? It, it, it did, but it also, uh, while you, I felt the pressure because you know there were articles on the. I think it was called the Buffalo Evening News. The front page read, "Let the hand of uh, E. B. Green strike him dead," or something like that. I mean, it, it was bad. <laughs> right. So Paul Schweiger has to leave town, and and the board then, board of directors of the museum has to reconsider the choice of architect, and, and they select Gordon Bunshaft, uh, who had already gotten some fame at SOM, the office that he was working at, uh, building office buildings, etc. and he was a native of Buffalo, so he comes here, and he designs uh, the 1962 edition, what the building we call the Knox Building, which opened its doors uh, to the public in January of 1962. But what happened when this building was designed and opened is that, okay, it didn't take the east or west facades of the neoclassical building, but it did cut into the park landscape, meaning it basically created a wall, if you wish, between Elmwood Avenue and Hoyt Lake, a part of Delaware Park that had been previously totally accessible and people would wander from the park side to the more urban side, the Buff State side. And right now, with this uh, long uh, new wing that extends from the south facade of the Wilmers building all the way towards Pennshurst Avenue, it basically blocked that access. So as we were thinking of the next iteration in the museum's architectural identity, we saw an opportunity to revitalize that park path. Previously, when you entered into the Knox building from Elmwood Avenue side, you'd walk into a relatively narrow corridor where there was a front desk in front of you. The first question you'd get is, are you a member? <laughs> and if you happen to answer no, you'd, I guess, have to flip a coin in your mind's eye or, and go left or right. And it wasn't very sort of, it wasn't a necessarily an architecturally welcoming portal. You know, you'd come into a corridor, front desk immediately in front of you, uh, in a place where there used to be a park path. So what we have been able to do, thanks to our brilliant designers, is open a new entrance uh, to the Knox building, to the east facade of the building, facing the, what used to be the only formal entry to the museum for 60 years, and then also eliminate the darkened glass that inhibited people from walking into this open-air sculpture courtyard. And now what you're able to do at any time when the museum is open is enter from the Hoyt Lake side or from the Elmwood Avenue side and basically walk that Olmsteadian Delaware Park path as you would have been doing 60 years ago. Now you are able to do that path or that walk through the park partly through a museum space that's free of admission charges. So when you do your crossing east-west mm -hmm. axis here, uh, you're not paying admission charges. And for a moment, you are covered uh, in uh, a space that used to be exposed to the elements, but is now covered by this amazing sculpture uh, created by Olafur Eliasson and Sebastian Behmann. And in a sense, the park now becomes accessible through the seasons, also in the winter time, as many of you who are listening to this uh, re recall in the winter time, you could not enter into the sculpture courtyard of the Knox building because there'd be three feet of snow there and the doors would be locked and you'd just sort of look at the snow through this black tinted glass. Now in the winter time, you can come here and you'll see the snowflakes uh, falling on top of common sky, you'll be warm, you can wear being a t-shirt and Bermuda shorts uh, <laughs> for all that matters in the middle of a buffalo winter. Uh, but at the same time, you're close to the elements as Bunshaft intended it. And I think the brilliance of the sculpture created by Olaf Elias and, and Sebastian Behemann is that it really salutes Gordon Bunshaft and at the same time adds something to it. It doesn't steal from Bunshaft, it makes uh, Bunshaft proud, if you wish. 
It's very welcoming, right? I mean, that's the whole. That's, that's the whole point of it. And, and the name says it all. It is, after all, our common sky. We share the sky, we share the space. When we look up at common sky, which has also these mirrored elements, we see through or next to the mirrored elements, we see the sky that we all look at. And then when we look carefully directly above us, we see our own reflection. And so the artwork tells us about who we are, where we are coming from, and what we share. It's our common humanity with all its individual aspects knitted into it. It's a, it's a fabulous space, it really is. I think the, the hardest part is it's for people normally come are going to expect, I have to pay when I walk in, right? right? Yes, <laughs> I, I, that, that, that's certainly something that people expect. Uh, I've been uh, used to it, I think. Uh, yeah, but, but people are getting used to the fact that they can, you can even imagine yourself being a jogger and wanting to take a shortcut or a restroom break. And you can actually do that now. So during museum operation hours, you can just cut through the building or use the restroom or stop by for coffee or have lunch. Uh, linger for 30 seconds if you're in a rush or spend the day. So making it a little more of a public space than it was previously. It's, it's a public living room now and, and people are taking already full advantage of that. We see that in our visitor numbers. Previously we would have uh, in a full year of operations a maximum of really 135,000 visitors, and we are now uh, approaching 45,000 in less than two months. So you can do the math. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, uh, where else would you like to take me? There's we could one. go take a look at the, uh, the Wilmers building, yes. where 235 works from the collection are installed, and we can talk about some of the artworks and also about some of the ways in which we hope to welcome uh, both old and new visitors to the museum. And maybe we can walk as we talk, but is that also part of the, the way this was constructed and then laid out as well, that this is a, a better way of utilizing the permanent collection here? Is it doing it better than the, the previous iteration? Uh, I, I would say so. Of course, ultimately, judgment must be left for our, our visitors, but based on the feedback we are receiving from our visitors, the museum feels warmer, more welcoming, easier to access. So we are now entering the Wilmers building, and here you have that front desk that previously used to be in front of the main entrance, but by this point you've already had time to sort of acclimatize yourself. You're already in the museum space, you're not sort of being hit by right. the need to make decisions about whether you stay or go <laughs> in the first minute. And as we walk up the steps into the Wilmers building, the first thing you'll notice is that the floor looks luminous. So the floor used to be marble, right. this very dark marble that's not very conducive to museum operations for several reasons, and I'll touch on those. It's not an aesthetic thing as much as it is about the fact that we need to install lights and paintings and sculptures. And when we do that, we use forklifts and scissor lifts, and you cannot drive on marble mm. without it breaking. So marble tiles are just about the most impractical floor <laughs> material you can imagine for a space that gets a lot of foot traffic, but also needs to accommodate uh, heavy machinery. We can't do what we do as a museum without scissor lifts and forklifts and all those things that we deploy when we install works of art and when we uh, illuminate them with lights from above. So what we've done here is we've replaced the marble with the original architect's own material, namely wood. And when I say the original architect's own material, E.B. Green designed this building in 1905. Seven years later, he dis, uh, dis designed the Toledo Art Museum at the other end of Lake Erie, and that's where he used wood in the galleries. So I think that he learned from the, <laughs> his first experience and then deployed a material that he knew museums would need. So these beautiful red oak wood floors now sort of reflect the light from the light tracks above, and the building just feels a lot area, not as heavy, and of course you don't hear the clink, clink, clink of the broken marble. Broken marble, right, right, right. And uh, so, you, 
and, and of course, just in terms of uh, foot traffic and, and being a museum visitor, wood on a, what's called a floating wood floor is much more forgiving on your feet. So you can spend a lot longer here without feeling the same strain on your, on, on your leg muscles. We have more to come on our tour with Yanni Seren, director of the Buffalo AKG Art Museum, about their push for public art throughout the region, the hopes and possibilities of the new Gunlock building, and how the institution responded to the community tragedy of May 14, 2022, when 10 people were killed in a racist attack on the Jefferson Avenue tops. Stay with us. We have more just ahead. This is What's Next on WBFO. Hey, is this thing on? Test, test, one, two. Sounds great. Let's go. The podcast world is overflowing with more than 750,000 podcasts to choose from. But for great local podcasts, you can now go to one place, the new Amplify BTPM Pods app. Here you can discover content produced in Western New York and Southern Ontario, our own backyard. With a wide variety of genres to choose from, there is something for everyone. Listen to the best independently produced podcast in the region anywhere, anytime. Download the free Amplify BTPM Pods app wherever you get your apps and begin exploring your local podcast community now. You're listening to What's Next, our place to discuss the important issues of our communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We want to hear from you. Click on the Talk to Us option in the WBFO app, and we will work to get your questions or comments on the air. Do you have a story or concern that we should be addressing? Email us using what's next at wbfo.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. Welcome back to What's Next. Today, we're hearing our tour of the Buffalo AKG Art Museum with its director, Yanni Seren. The way that the Wilmers Building has been laid out in terms of the collection is really chronological, but it's chronological with a tweak. And all of this is uh, the work of our Godin Spalding senior curator for the collection, Holly Hughes. She is uh, a brilliant master of installing artworks. And of course, she has worked with her colleagues in the department, Charles Balbach, chief curator, Kathleen Chaffee, and several others. But really, it's Holly's master work that you see at play here. So when we are in this first room, um, of the Wilmers building, we call it Gallery 3. That's its numerical hmm. digit and designator. And you see three works. Uh, you see uh, a work by Albert Bierstadt, the, Pica, the Marina Piccola on the island of Capri, painted in 1859. This is the first major painting to enter the museum's collection. And it was a gift of the artist by Bierstadt himself and he gifted it to the new museum that had just opened its doors in 1863. So this idea that we're not collecting art that has been around for decades and decades, but we're collecting the contemporary, really begins at the time of our incorporation and our inception as an art museum. So you're looking at a painting that is four years old when it comes into the museum's collection. Now we look at it today and it looks kind of classical and even conservative in some ways in terms of its style and technique. But back in 1863, when Bierstadt gifted this fresh work, it was radical and new by American art standards. Then on the south wall, you have Rock Leaves, uh, dialogue number one of 1960, and this is really an example of our Abex collection's power and its global renown. And if I'm not mistaken, this was prominently displayed previously, it correct? It certainly was. Yeah. So you've got a Bierstadt, and you've got Gottlieb, and then you've got Rashid Johnson, Fallen Man, a recent acquisition. Uh, I think we've acquired this work about seven years ago. It dates from 1915. So in this one room, you sort of have the museum's DNA. Each of these works, they, they are separated by 160 years in terms of time. Each one of them was acquired at the time that the work was created. And each one is a reflection of the fact that from the very beginning of our history as a museum, we've been a contemporary art museum. In fact, if you were to look at the annals of art museums in the world, you would find that we are probably the first world's first contemporary art museum, certainly the first in the United States. 
when the Buffalo Fine Arts Academy, as we were called back in 1862, was incorporated, there were no museums on Manhattan. MoMA was established in 1929, the Whitney and the Guggenheim in the 1930s, and the new museum much later. So all the museums that we sort of regard as the icons of modern and contemporary art, none of them were around. It would take decades for those museums to be incorporated, and we were, you know, already at that point operational, had been operational for six decades or longer. Now, of course, you were under construction for these many years, but if I'm not mistaken, acquisitions were continuing throughout that time, correct? Yes. We are very fortunate to have a robust acquisition budget, so during our let's say planning, designing, and construction phase, and we really start the clock in 2016. That's when we hired OMA and Shohei Shigematsu and his team as our architect partner. So we've acquired more than 500 works between then and today, many of them on view in the new Jeffrey Gunlock building. Very good, very good. And what should we know about uh, what we're seeing in these trends? Are there trends that you are seeing from them? Or so that... it's very interesting. You know, we are right now, of course, in the, in the 19th century galleries of the museum where you'll find works from the 19th century, from realism to impressionism, post-impressionism, and then we move into Fauz, Fauvism, Cubism, suprematism, surrealism, etc. And all of those periods were defined by a style or an ism of some sort. You could pick out a work from the 1940s and 1950s because it was of its time. It's very difficult today to articulate or define any style. What's the style of the second decade of the 21st century? There isn't one. Artists um, are exploring in an eclectic fashion uh, different types of modalities of visual expression anywhere from abstraction to high photorealism, digital things, you name it, it's all in the package. Now the problem today for anybody working in art museums or in the art, visual art field in general, is that there are more active uh, contemporary artists than there have ever been before in human history. So there are, that just the pure number of visual mark makers, if you wish, has exponentially increased. I had a conversation with uh, an artist who is one of the most renowned post-World War II painters and sculptors, Anselm Kiefer, a German artist, and he said to me, Janne, you as a museum director have an impossible job today because the number of great artists in the world remains constant. It's just that the haystack has grown larger and you are always looking for the needle, but your job is much tougher today than it was five decades ago. And proof of that in some ways is the fact that had you and I been on Manhattan in 1950s, there were about six or seven galleries that dealt in contemporary art. Today there are more than a thousand in the five boroughs of New York City. So if you and I had gone to New York and wanted to see galleries of contemporary art, we would have had about six, seven locations to really visit. And we've had a, we would have a pretty good handle on what's on the cutting edge, what's happening, what's, what's going on. Today we'd have to go to a thousand galleries and we'd never have the time to do that. And even if we did, we'd come out of that uh, visit through those galleries thinking about, well, how would I describe this moment to an extraterrestrial in a <laughs> half a page <laughs> a document or something. Right. Like, how would I define the style of today? Now, we could say that, okay, well, there are things that are happening in the digital realm that weren't happening five decades ago, but is that a style or is that just the invention of a new technique or technology? It's uncertain, I think, the response to that question. How would one respond to that? I'm not sure myself. So right. I don't think that we can look at today and say that there is a style that defines today other than that there are a multitude of styles and artists are feeling liberated to select whichever modality of expression, expression they feel comfortable with. It's one of the challenges, of course, of our time as well because it makes it seem a bit chaotic. Hmm. That uh, sounds like it could keep you up a little bit at night thinking about that type of thing. 
We can it, move on. It does. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you didn't have enough of a, to deal with with an expansion project, but yeah. <laughs> so uh, expansion projects are, are always tricky because you have so many constituencies that you are listening to and working with and wanting to serve. And the extraordinary part about this project was that typically what happens is that a cultural institution, in this case an art museum, needs more space, they want to expand, they list the reasons that they want to expand, and then they do a design competition and from a s number of designs submitted by a number of different architects, they pick one that they like and then they build it. We did not do that. We first went to our community here in Western New York through really nine months worth of town hall meetings and asked them fundamental questions, asked our fellow citizens in Western New York fundamental questions. Do you think we should expand? Do you think it's important for the museum to have space? Where do you think we should expand? On our current campus or somewhere else? So this, and then, then we realized that yes, the, the public does indicate to us that there is a need for more space, but they have parameters around it. Don't build on parkland. Get rid of the ugly parking lot. Do this, do that. You know, make the museum more accessible. Do all of those things. So now we had a list of desirables that came from the public, and we had a list of desirables that we had created. And we had to merge those lists so that we could put a check on each one of them, not just ours as an institution, but on the public's desirables, desired results from an expansion. And we realized that if we're going to run a design competition, we'll never get the result we want because a design competition will yield something totally different than what's on these lists of <laughs> desirables. So instead, we ran a competition to identify a partner. And we told all the architects who responded, the finalists who were responded to our RFP request for proposals, that we ask you to propose some designs, in fact, three different ones, but we won't build any of them. We are only looking for the best partner for the museum. And once we've selected the partner, we'll design the museum together. And that's exactly what happened. OMA and Shohei Shigematsu, and specifically Shohei Shigematsu, not the firm OMA, but Shohei Shigematsu and his specific team were selected as our partners. And that was then written into the contract. And what they had proposed in their proposals, none of that exists on the campus. I mean, underground parking, you could say, was one of the things. <laughs> okay. But, but the, the, the design that you see there, the new building, that, there's nothing in the original documents that indicates that building. So it has a, an organic... It, it, it. it was developed in partnership with the curators, with myself, with board members, uh, with the community. Shohei did town hall meetings himself, and that's the result we have now. And I think that part of the reason we are receiving these incredibly positive reviews is that this building is the child of all of us, hmm. not just Shohei, not the board, not me, not the curators, not just the community, but also the community. But it is a collaborative process of conception. Not immaculate conception, <laughs> no, but conception. No. Well, it was a lot harder than that, that's for sure. Uh, and of course, now we're heading uh, back into, this is the original building right here, yes, right? Yes, yeah. we are walking into uh, the sculpture courtyard of the Wilmers building, which also has been fully restored. If, you, if we had stood here five years ago, or three and a half years ago for that matter, and looked at this floor, more than 50% of the marble floor tiles would have been broken. So they've all been restored with new marble, and you can see how harmoniously the new pieces fit uh, into the mix with the old. Uh, I mean, this courtyard was in horrible shape. Also, if you look up, you see these wonderful gilded starbursts coming from the so-called coffins in the ceiling. Uh, those were all painted white, and it was actually during the construction process when some white paint was flaking from the ceiling, and our facilities manager went up there, 
and scraped some of the white flaking white paint off and underneath the white paint discovered these beautiful starbursts and then we had to restore all of them because we we just had to do it it was important for us to get back what was painted over in the 1950s and uh, now you have this amazing sculpture courtyard fully restored to its old old glory and it just looks looks amazing it really does it's something when I was here, I, I, it almost seemed like a totally different room. Exactly. And yet, the only thing we've done is really restored it. Right. And I think what is so easy to forget is that people look on the campus at what's new, the new building, uh, perhaps Common Sky, the artwork by Olaf Erlius and Sebastian Behman that we discussed. But about half of what we've done has been historic preservation. I mean, the, the sewer pipes in the Wilmers building were from 1905, which meant that only half of those pipes was, was left. I mean, the upper half, the lower half had pretty much corroded. And so we had to open the entire basement of the Wilmers building and put in new pipes, new electrical cords. You know, there's a lot of things that are not visible to the human eye that lies behind the walls or under the floors or above the ceilings. And that's so that this building and the Knox building can live for another century. Uh, but historic preservation work and the restoring and rehabilitation of older buildings uh, takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of time. Uh, and it has to be done carefully. And it highlights also maybe the condition that the museum was in before we under construction. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, you know, when we started this project we had an initial <laughs> then aspirational budget of 40 to 60 million in the back of my mind I had 13 alarm bells going off telling me that I can't even fix the old buildings with that but it's almost like in American football where you have to move the ball down the, the, the field 10 yards at a time and in our case we had to move it down 10 million at a time and so for a total of 230 million, the project was finally realized and not to have debt and to have been able to complete that fundraising uh, between 2016 and today is of course a, a, a testament to the hard work of numerous individuals who have, uh, have both contributed and raised those funds. Uh, 195 million uh, went to the construction and then 35 million an injection into our operating endowment funds. When I started at the museum back in April of 2013, we had 62 full-time employees. Our annual operating budget was 6.7 million. Uh, and now we have 190 employees and our annual operating budget is 17 and a half million. So the museum has grown exponentially uh, in the last 10 years. And Part of it is the physical growth, but the other part is just the growth of our operations and our staff. That is Yanni Seren, director of the Buffalo AKG Art Museum, here on What's Next. Late summer, he gave us a tour of the new facility, and coming up, we'll take our first look at the new Gunlock building. This is What's Next on WBFO. I'm Kraus Schellhorn with Mindful Music. Join me for thoughtful and in-depth conversation with my many different guests from around the region and the world as they discuss how music helps and heals in times of stress and everyday life. Listen to Mindful Music Saturdays at 4 p.m. right here on WBFO, your NPR station. Buffalo is home to many historical treasures, including architectural gems. Central Terminal affected everybody. Everybody from the common man to the movie star walked this concourse. Beloved community establishments. They might get a glimpse to see Lena Horne. Uh, they might uh, see Dizzy or Miles Davis, uh, you know, Charlie Parker. And homes for local sports teams. When we talk about an institution, Memorial Auditorium was an institution. The WNED PBS original production, Remembering Western New York, Explore some of these iconic structures and their connection to people who live in the region. There was a time when Buffalo's Main Street was the focus of holiday shopping in Western New York. Watch Remembering Western New York now on YouTube. You're listening to What's Next 
our place to discuss the important issues of our communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We want to hear from you. Click on the Talk to Us option in the WBFO app, and we will work to get your questions or comments on the air. Do you have a story or concern that we should be addressing? Email us using what's next at wbfo.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. We're back on What's Next with more of our tour with Yanni Seren, director of the Buffalo AKG Art Museum. Yanni Seren calls himself a vagabond who has lived and worked in several countries, but he has now been part of Buffalo for a decade, and he possesses an uncanny working knowledge of the museum dating back to its 19th century origins. Ahead, he takes us inside the new Gunlock building, but first, we get into a sensitive conversation about his institution, the realities of the city of Buffalo, and how the museum is addressing those issues. Talk a little bit about that, about the growth of the of the institution, and also perhaps it's how it's integrated, how it reflects this community. Um, uh, we talked a little bit before we started the tape about on May 14th of uh, 2022 yep. was a the tops the tops massacre. Again, you're, you're here and you're overseeing this construction and this rehabilitation um, and expansion, but at the same time, this community went through something that arguably it never had before. How does an institution like this, how does it respond, how does it integrate with the issues that have come out of, of that tragedy? Unfortunately, the TOPS uh, May 14th tragedy is only one of so many such tragedies in the United States where gun violence is, is prolific. Um, this one, of course, hit us who live here, who call Buffalo and Western New York home. It hit us hard. But long before May 14th, 22, the Buffalo AKG Art Museum had committed itself to building really two buildings, one of them this physical building that we are in or set of buildings that we are in right now, and the other one uh, a building of ideas. And our building of ideas uh, was made of the bricks and mortar of what we call idea, that's uh, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. And, and that's something that we really launched into before we laid the first brick down uh, in terms of this expansion because if a museum is not of its community and for its community it's a totally futile exercise to build anything new uh, it's just you know you can spend the dollars but if you don't do it of the people and for the people it's not really worth it so what does community engagement and idea work then mean for us well it really began in our case uh, with us saying that we want to think of the museum beyond the museum's walls. We, are, we want to expand our artistic program into the community, and we did that through the Public Art Initiative, which began with a staff of zero back in 2013. And is <laughs> it's now, become wildly popular, And right? has become wildly popular and is really regarded as one of the transformative agencies of the museum, and many people know the museum not through what's on its walls here on its Elmwood Avenue campus, but through what we do in the community through the Public Art Initiative. Uh, we've also created an entirely new department, uh, which is called the Community Engagement Department. It has its own director. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Callie Johnson is now deputy mayor with the city of Buffalo, <laughs> right, right. so the <laughs> position is open and we are searching for do Dr. Johnson's successor, but uh, you know, I'm sure we'll find a, a qualified candidate. We've actually had a lot of applications for that leadership team position. So to think of public art, think of a department whose entire job is all about community engagement, a, uh, a department that has a seat at the leadership team level of the museum that is accountable to a board committee that looks over community engagement. All those are facets of our house of idea, our house of 
inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. So I think that the museum has fundamentally taken a look at its previously inward-looking self and turned that inward-looking self into an outward-looking self, meaning a museum that's open to the community, that wants to embrace the community, and also wants to be a reflection of the community, and that reflection means that our staff is also today more diverse than it has ever been in the past. I mentioned Callie Johnson. Right. Uh, you know, we have our leadership team is about nine people, and, and uh, we have more diversity on that leadership team than we have had ever in the museum's 160-year history. Is that something that there's a saying that art always kind of reflects what is really going on in society before society really re realizes that? Was that kind of what you saw here, or was that something that came out of you and your staff that we see this is a, a part of this community that's lacking, that there is a, 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 a part of the, a large segment of Buffalo that is, uh, is, not, is, is forgotten in some ways. Certainly, I think we, we felt it and saw it. Um, the, tw the 20th century was so siloed in so many ways. I mean, you could say segregated or siloed, but we, we created artificial silos. And I think that in the 21st century, you asked about some of these trends. I think that we are seeing a trend to break silos. It doesn't mean that you get one style emerging out of it, but you get a plethora of styles and combinations and synergies and convergences. We are standing here in Gallery 17 next to Jackson Pollock's mm. painting Convergence, and you know it's one of those paintings that we could use as a metaphor for what's happening today, meaning it is uh, a converging of different tendencies, people, backgrounds, religions, aspirations, hopes, wishes. We don't live in our 1950s silos anymore where there were certain modalities of conduct, behavior, expression, uh, and so forth. Uh, but rather there is this kind of constant motion vortex, if you wish, of people, of thoughts, of ideas, of things. Um, that are coming together and sometimes parting ways and sometimes it's a bit messy and difficult uh, but at the same time it, it is an expression of the human spirit of today. Um, I look at young people who come to the museum and I think if there's one constant it's the, the awesome naive wisdom of young eyes mm. who can look at the world in a new and fresh way each day. I just hope that they, those eyes are not too much negatively impacted by all the digital screens that they, they are exposed <laughs> right. to. And I mean that in purely optical ways. I mean, uh, I think the jury is out on whether, whether you know, the things that come to us through various different screens are good or bad. But I, I do think that you shouldn't look at the sun without sunglasses and you shouldn't look at too many screens for too many hours <laughs> because it'll just <laughs> kill your eyes. <laughs> and uh, that's not a good thing. Right. So we've come to an interesting gallery. This is Gallery 16. It's, it's just a, such a marvelous space because it has our amazing uh, yellow and orange Rothko, our Helen Frankenthal, our Bob Feely, our Sam Francis, and of course the Larry Poon's Orange Crush. Uh, along with Smith's Tank Totem sculpture. It's such a wonderful, uplifting space. I mean, people just walk in this room and they, they say, oh, I, I, you know, I've said this sort of a set moment of arrival here. But interestingly, from this room, you can walk into a bridge that's named the John J. Albright Bridge. Mm. And this bridge allows us oh. to connect with a new part of the campus. So we're walking in this bridge that has a run length of about a 200 or so feet. Um, on our right, we see Hoyt Lake. Mm. And to our left, we see the new Jeffrey Gunlock building. And this bridge itself, it has a very practical function. It's here to connect the old part of the campus with the new part. It's also a path through which we can move artworks between the buildings easily but it's also a sculpture in its own right and uh, a sort of manifestation of Shohei Shigematsu's architectural design brilliance. 
we needed a connector. It would have been very difficult to build this connector underground and it would have disrupted the foundations of the Wilmers building. So instead of doing that, he created a bridge that loops around five Olmsted oak trees and you can just imagine how difficult it was <laughs> to build this bridge because the closest oak tree is only about two feet away from the side of these Whoa. glass panels. Right. <laughs> but it's a, it's a very inspiring and beautiful space that uh, allows us to traverse uh, through the campus. Uh, to our right, as we are approaching the Gunlock building, we see our new loading dock. We are so happy about that loading dock because now we can finally bring artworks safely into the building. Previously, as you recall, we would have to park an uh, 18 wheeler at the bottom of the Delaware stairs on the east side of the Wilmers building, then hire a crane and then crane in artworks into the w Wilmers building through snowstorms or rainstorms or thunderstorms. And now we have a loading dock and all the art can come safely and traverse the entire museum campus by coming in, uh, backing into the, into the Gunlock building. As we're walking across this bridge and having this chance to look out, I wanted just to ask you another community issue, the future of the Skijakler, the 198. You've done, this marvelous job, we're looking out at the Great Lawn right now, as a matter of fact, which is yes. uh, obviously was very popular with that concert recently. But uh, to that, obviously, the way this was redesigned took very much into account the Olmsted vision. What about for the 198? It's a community issue. Where, where, does, uh, where do you think about it? I guess I'll just ask you, what do you think rather than the institution? <laughs> so, um, well, let's first take a look at the Skachakwada and at Delaware Park. First of all, one of the interesting things about the new Gunlock building is that it gives us a bird's eye view of Olmsted's Delaware Park as well as of the Skachakwada that we've never had before. Right. So we can, it's difficult to conceptualize a space or think about whether it should be or not be there if you are looking at it from the vantage point of a pedestrian, or from the sort of uh, ground level view, because you can't see it holistically. And to interpret these things in plan, are, that's always a difficult exercise unless you're trained as a landscape architect or an architect for that matter. But now that we are here and we clearly see the Skachakwada and we clearly see Delaware Park's beauty we're now on the second floor, by the way, but we could go a floor up and even get a higher vantage point on both. I think it does raise the question of what is and what should be the future uh, of this urban highway. Um, I, I think that my job as a museum director is not to cast judgment uh, or to say what should or should not be done. What I'll say is this, um, I think that um, human life is precious and I think health is vital to human life. I bicycle to work or walk to work about 90% of the time and it's very difficult to do that if your community is um, separated or segregated by highways that are meant for cars going 50 plus miles per hour. I, I think that the notion of having a highway like that with a 30 mile per hour speed limit is sort of dissonant with its intended purpose. And I think that that generates frustration uh, in people using it. Uh, I understand the reasons why this has been made to be so. There was a terrible accident. Uh, a young child lost his life or her life. Um, I understand these things, but I think that urban planning and urban design should always begin with both the needs of the moment and of the time and always with the utmost respect for human life. And the question that should be asked is, does this highway express the utmost respect for human life. Thank you for that answer, I appreciate it. Probably didn't expect that one, but I couldn't, I mean, just looking at how you have really reclaimed this property, not just the space, and brought, and got rid of the parking lot, which of course everyone right. wanted, and just make it look like more of a park, yes. I think um, it 
kind of stands out next to what is now the Skajak Well. Um, and, and here we are on this, talking of a park, we are on this sculpture terrace, and in many ways this sculpture terrace replicates that moment that we experienced under common sky, where we are in an indoor space, but in an indoor space that very much connects with the outdoor space. So the sculpture terrace on the second floor of the Gunlock building really wraps around the building like a belt, 360 degrees, and as you walk around the sculpture terrace, you are constantly orienting yourself in relation to the city beyond the museum. And that notion of connecting with the city beyond the museum, perhaps you are hearing it, it's a recurring leitmotif in what we've been doing. We've been connecting with the city beyond through our public art initiative. We are connecting with the city beyond through the architecture of the entire campus now. So it's all about creating a sense of connectivity and porousness between the museum and beyond the museum to the point that we hope that when people are driving on Elmwood Avenue and looking at Robert Irving's light piece, Niagara, they are connecting with it, hopefully not being distracted <laughs> from driving, but uh, are connecting with it and are feeling that I'm part of the museum. I might not be in there right now physically, like right there uh, where Yanne is being interviewed by right. someone, but I'm still almost there. Right. I'm, I'm connecting with it. And that notion of connectivity and belonging, uh, I think is uh, really important, meaningful, and uh, impactful. And of course, one thing that you often feel in art museums is uh, a sense of confusion. But when you can connect with the landscape that's around you, you feel a sense of understanding because you're not feeling lost. You kind of orient yourself in relation to the familiar and then you walk into a gallery. We've just stepped into one on the second floor of the Gunlock building and you can now let your eyes be challenged and your mind be challenged by works of contemporary art that don't reveal their secrets to you immediately or in the instant, but you sort of have to work at it. But because as a navigator of the museum space, you don't feel lost. You allow yourself to be challenged in an interesting way by works by Anish Kapoor, for example, or Paul Fardischeld, or Piazza Gate, who's created this magnificent tapestry out of fire hose. And you're looking at it thinking, well, you know how you could do that? And what's the <laughs> meaning of this whole thing? And it's just fire hose. And then you walk a little closer, closer to the work, and you see the sort of printed letters on this fire hose that clearly refer to its gauge and its ability to deliver a certain number of gallons of water per minute and whatnot. But then you see this 1962 printed on it, and then in your mind's eye, you return back to the 1960s and you start thinking of the moment in American history at the time of the civil rights movement and what were fire hoses used for at that time? Well, they were used to break up riots and by the police and the fire departments as they were trying to quell the rising voices of Americans who wanted liberty and equality for all. Wow. So here you have an African-American artist using fire hose and it seems non-consequential or even insignificant or banal until you realize that there was a time when the power of that water gushing out from that fire hose was literally wiping people off the street as if to whitewash the street. Mm. Uh, we're running a l low on time here, so I would like to just, if you could, just your, your thought to Western New York about what they have here now at the Buffalo AKG Art Museum. Well, I, I of course, um, I'm a vagabond. You know, I, uh, I moved to Buffalo. It's the 14th city where I've lived. I've lived in seven countries. So I'm, I'm a vagabond or a nomad, whichever way you want to designate me. I, I do hope that Western New Yorkers and Buffalonians uh, will enjoy this museum because we have built it for you uh, we haven't built it for ourselves, and we hope that this can be uh, a space of healing, a space of learning, 
uh, a space of happiness, a space of wonder, uh, and a place of pride. Uh, the museum, the Buffalo AKG Art Museum, is one of the world's most renowned and respected art museums. I'm not sure if everybody in Western New York knows that. We cheer the bills, I cheer them too. But the Buffalo AKG Art Museum is in a league that is always in the finals. It's always with a gold medal around its neck. Uh, so I think Buffalonians, whether you are museum goers or not, uh, we all need those things, hope, love, beauty, connectivity, and solace. And you can find them here. Take advantage of your national treasure that's located on Elmwood Avenue. Yanni Seren, uh, first thanks for the time and congratulations on this work. It's beautiful. Thank you very much. That concludes the What's Next tour of the Buffalo AKG Art Museum with its director, Yanni Seren. We thank him and his staff for giving us the time to see the new look and the new building, but also to talk about the many issues that intersect with the world of art. This is What's Next on WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Olean, and WUBJ Jamestown, your NPR station.